Courtney? We are. All right. Well, once again, officially, welcome everybody. Um, these are brave new times, and I am not a technology guy at all, so I really appreciate Ron Wynn's help, and I appreciate everybody uh, uh, hopping on to this new media. Normally, especially us nature folks like to be out in the field. We like to be out in the streams and the parks and uh, uh, engaging our interests, whether it's birds or reptiles and amphibians out in the field. We can't really do that as a group now, so this was a, a great option to um, keep the knowledge flow going. So I am Tom Scollins. I am one of the curators of herpetology with the Natural History Society, as well as um, I run the Herp Club, uh, Natural History Society of Maryland. Um, fosters stewardship of our natural world, um, education uh, about every aspect of natural history. As I mentioned earlier, we have several clubs for the different disciplines. Uh, we have guest speakers that come to our building. Uh, our museum is located on Bel Air Road in Baltimore. Um, and um, I don't know if we can put up a link uh, on here, but it's marylandnature.org where you can go and learn all about us. What's great about our group uh, is we're all volunteer, and we have this tremendous knowledge base from all our volunteers. And not only are they super knowledgeable people, but knowledge is kind of useless if you're not willing to share it. Um, and all of our folks are really great about sharing their knowledge. They're very generous with their time. They're very generous with their knowledge. And uh, it's, it's, it's a very two-way um, uh, learning environment. Our club meetings, we have PhDs and we have young children. Um, and I learn something all the time from the kids. I learn from other members. So it's, it's not strictly a one-way flow of knowledge. Um, and since we are an all-volunteer organization, we do rely on our members and we rely on our memberships to keep things like this afloat. Um, and you can find out more at MarylandNature.org. If you're not a member, please, please consider joining up. Obviously, times are tough for everyone, but um, every little bit helps us, and then we can continue these great programs for everybody. Um, so today, timely enough, it's a beautiful spring day, at least where I am at the moment, and that can change at any moment here in Maryland in April, but it's currently a very pretty spring day, and spring is the time for amphibians. Amphibians, most of them hibernate all winter or at least go dormant. And if you've been out on the trails, you've been near any um, wetlands, you might have seen some on the warmer nights, you might have heard some spring peepers calling. Uh, so we thought it was a perfect time since we couldn't go out and do some field trips to do this um, Zoom meeting about amphibians in particular. It's also Earth Month, and it's also today is Save the Frog Day, uh, mm -hmm. which was started. Um, uh, for the Panamanian golden frogs, um, which were almost completely wiped out by chytrid fungus, which we'll discuss a little bit later on. So it's a great amphibian time of year. Um, amphibians are a huge, they, they're a huge group of animals. You have reptiles, you have amphibians. So amphibians are classified basically by moist, scaleless skin. So that kind of goes to uh, Felicity's question. Uh, reptiles have scales, have that dry, scaly skin. Amphibians have moist, permeable skin, which is important to remember. So they don't have scales, they have moist, permeable skin, they drink, they absorb water through their skin, and a lot of species actually breathe through their skin. So that makes them very vulnerable to disturbances in the environment, pollutants. Uh, they're a key uh, uh, species. If you have a habitat with a lot of amphibians, a healthy amphibian population, you know that that environment is a healthy environment. Um, conversely, they're the first to disappear from an environment when things go south. If there's pollution, if there's uh, degradation or a wetland is drained for development, all of those have an immediate impact usually on the amphibian populations. Um, they're tied to the water. The word amphibian actually means dual life uh, because amphibians start their life in the water uh, in a larval stage, either a tadpole or, or uh, a gilled larvae for salamanders. And then they go through this incredible process of metamorphose, 
which they turn into a air breathing uh, animal that some dwell on the land, some kind of live uh, half in, half out of water. Nature, there's no, there's, there's lots of rules and there's just as many exceptions to those rules. So generally when we're speaking today, it's gonna be in gen general terms, but because um, there is a whole group of salamanders that go through a direct life cycle where the eggs are laid in a wet log and baby tiny, you know, like redback salamanders is one example. Um, they don't have a larval stage. They come right out as little tiny miniature salamanders to take on the world. Um, in the United States, we have um, 230 species of amphibians. So about 190 of those are salamanders. Um, that changes periodically because we're constantly reclassifying species based on DNA. Um, but so approximately 190 species of salamanders, uh, which is one of the largest uh, biomasses of salamanders in the world, which is why if an introduced threat such as um, the bee sal fungus, which is another fungus that's wiping out populations in Europe, gets here, we're going to see a tremendous uh, impact for our salamanders. Um, so again, we're dealing with very vulnerable animals, um, and so that's one of the key points we want to get across today. Um, I'm just checking the chat to see if there's any updated questions. Okay, so uh, worldwide we got about 9,000 species. Um, about 7,000 of those are frogs. Uh, so amphibians um, are frogs, toads, salamanders, and these weird little worm-like things called Sicilians. Um, they're all, again, uh, they, they start their life in water and then they um, uh, metamorphose onto land. Uh, can we put those um, slides up? So we have some pictures and I'll, I'll go through, just so, uh, these are all, I'm pretty sure they're all gonna be native critters. Yes, okay, so step one. So we have frogs and salamander examples in these, uh, in these slides. So at the very top left, there's a fat green guy. That's a green frog, aptly named. And I can't. Okay. Felicity wants to know what are Sicilians exactly. Okay, I'll get to that. I'll get to that in a minute. So we'll run through these. I just wanted to show kind of a general example of what we're talking about. You don't have the green frog up top left here is real typical, um, typical frog in body shape. Um, he lives really common around all of our ponds, rivers, wetlands. Um, they start life in the water as a tadpole um, and they morph out into this um, lovely little frog. Um, uh, next to him, uh -oh, we lost him. Where our slides go? Can we get those slides back up? Um, See, we're all working. So uh, Felicity wants to know what are Sicilians exactly? So Sicilians are another um, group of amphibians. They're, they look just like worms. They live underground, uh, mostly in tropical environments. Um, they, uh, they're pretty much blind and they eat earthworms and things like that, but they just look like a giant earthworm. Um, but some of them are blue, some of them are blue and yellow. They're really neat uh, a group of very primitive amphibians. Uh, okay, so our slides are back up. So next to our green frog is an example, uh, body-wise, of uh, a larval salamander. So salamanders don't, uh, don't have tadpoles. They have the what we call larvae. Uh, it's pretty much the same idea. They start their life in water. They have these external gills on either side of their head. Tom? Yep. Just can, can you make sure that if there's any other people coming in the waiting room, you can let them in? I can't see that with gotcha. the okay. Up. okay. Let Sorry. me. Participants. I don't, I don't see anybody. I could be wrong. So that would be in the managed participants. I don't, I don't see anybody. Oh, 
would that be under the security tab or the managed participants problem? Yeah, I don't see anybody in there. Okay, so we have our, so that's an example basically of what, how our, a lot of our salamanders start off life. So when they morpho, when they go through metamorphos uh, and come out, or out into the land, they absorb those gills, that tail fin disappears, and they take on more of your typical uh, salamander body shape. So next to that is one of our native frogs here in the uh, Northeast, the wood frog. Now the wood frogs are the first to come out in the spring. You'll have spring peepers and you'll have wood frogs. Um, they'll, and they'll call from ponds when there's still ice on the ponds. They're very, very cold tolerant. They can be found all the way up into Northern Canada. And they're actually able to freeze solid, which is one of the unique um, aspects of that frog. Um, the sugars and the urea that's in their bloodstream actually acts as an antifreeze. And they, they freeze solid, they thaw out in the springtime and they come out completely ready to go. Uh, that lower left picture, it's kind of a good collage. Uh, it, these were all um, amphibians from one of our local vernal pools. Um, so the green glob of jelly is a spotted salamander egg mass. Uh, spotted salamanders are one of the first to migrate to ponds in the springtime here in the Northeast. And to the right of that is a, a, a whiter jelly mass that's also spotted salamanders. Um, they were just more freshly laid. A neat aspect about spotted salamanders, that green is actually a symbiotic algae. The algae is actually in the oviducts of the female spotted salamanders. And they colonize these egg masses, and the algae provides oxygen for the growing, um, I lost words, embryo, there it is. The growing embryo in that egg mass gets oxygen from the algae, the algae gets a place to live, and that's why vernal pools, um, uh, these salamanders do better in environments where the canopy is more open and more sunlight is hitting the pond. Um, to the top there is a wood frog egg mass. So typically in, in the Northeast, you'll have spotted salamanders and wood frogs all laying at the same time. Somebody's up near no, I got you. Now they're okay. Cool. All right, moving on. Next, uh, next to them are the spring peepers. These guys are really, really neat. They're only about the size of your thumbnail. Tiny little tree frogs, and they are the harbingers of spring. They're the first ones you're going to hear in the springtime. Um, really loud, shrill peep. Um, uh, typical frog body shape. They're just super tiny. And they have little suction cups on their toes. They are a species of tree frogs, so they'll actually call from blades of grass um, that are sticking out of the water. You can see those vocal sacs. Some frogs um, have them underneath their chin. Some frogs have them on the sides of their heads. Um, and frogs, that's how they advertise uh, for mates. That's how they defend territories. And they all have a very unique call that's specific to their species. So next to these teeny tiny little frogs, we have our largest salamander in the United States. That is our hellbender, and that is one big salamander. Um, they also go by snot otter. They go by lasagna lizard, Allegheny alligator, uh, but the correct common name if there is one is hellbender. They are, again, our largest salamander in the United States. They are endangered throughout their range. They're fully aquatic, and they require very fast, highly oxygenated water to live in. Uh, so in areas where there's not a very good buffer zone around rivers, runoff from development or agricultural fields creates silt in these rivers and it chokes out the eggs of these hellbenders. Uh, so it's important to, again, maintain environment in large tracts because it's not just the forest that you're preserving, but it's the river that runs through that forest. Uh, there are still healthy populations um, of this salamander in, in uh, some parts of West Virginia, but they are threatened throughout their range. But an incredible, incredible animal. And then um, next to him is a very tiny salamander. This is our uh, northern two-line salamander, and they're only, they're only about three, four inches maximum. Um, so you just get an idea of the wide range of sizes 
and environments that amphibians live in. So they live in the trees, they live in rivers. Um, pretty much the only environment they don't live in is salt water, and that's because they have that permeable skin um, that they wouldn't be able to um, survive the salt. Um, okay. Hey, Tom. I'm got, I just got my, yes, go ahead. Yeah, someone had a question about holding the, uh, the snot otter. The, uh, yes. the guy. Okay, so, um, yes, yeah, so the question um, about wearing gloves um, while holding the hellbender. So, when handling amphibians, wearing gloves is an option. Um, it's all it's all specific. So you shouldn't handle amphibians if you have lotions on your hand or if you're going from one animal to another. Um, handling amphibians, your skin must be clean and it must be wet. Um, in that particular case, we were just in that one river and we were just handling that animal. There was no going from animal to animal and everybody's hands were completely wet after surveying for animals. Um, so in clinical settings, when you're going from one animal to another, it's, it's certainly great to do that. Um, if you're just handling one animal in one area, um, it's not going to hurt the animal as long as your hands are wet ahead of time and you don't have dry skin that's going to damage that mucus layer on the animal. Or if you don't have any, you know, lotion, I'm not the kind of person to ever have lotion on my hands. So that's never an issue for me. Um, but it's a, it's a great question. And yes, if, if, in, if certainly if they're doing surveys of populations, um, you want to wear gloves if you're going from animal to animal. Um, likewise, if you're in the field, just to touch on, on this real quickly, um, it's important to clean equipment. If you're, if you're, you know, if you're out catching tadpoles with a net, um, they have to be disinfected because with the current threat of, um, uh, these various funguses that are attacking our amphibian populations, you don't want to go from population to population to potentially introduce pathogens from one pond to the next or one river to the next. Um, but you know, absolutely great, great question. Um, and and actually, that was done under permit as well because most areas you can't disturb the animals without um, what's called a scientific um, permit or a collection permit, depending on the state that you're in. Um, um, earlier on, Felicity had a question about um, amphibians vertebra. Yeah, I'd like to follow up from Felicity. So um, they, I don't know if she's getting at something specifically here that may, I may not know about. And if so, please type it in. Um, they have, they are um, vertebrates. They have a backbone. Um, and that's what's really neat about finding tiny little animals is they have tiny little bones. It's, it's the same uh, skeletal structure from Salamander to salamander is just some are much tinier than others, um, and uh, but yes, they are they are backboned animals, um, and they have a um, spinal cord and, and all that goes with it. Um, but if you were looking for something a little bit more specific, type it in. I'll, I'll keep an eye on it for you. Um, let's see. So we define our amphibians with their moist skin. They're tied to the water with their jelly-like eggs. Um, and since we just came off the photos with our vernal pool residents, and you can see I'm actually moistening my hands now. So I got a, a couple of specimens and hopefully they show up well on the camera. So this is one of our local salamanders. This is the, let me see if we can do this, spotted salamander. Normally we find them with flashlights. Here he is. Can we see him? Look at that little face. He's saying hello to everybody. So it's spotted salamanders. This is a mole salamander. And they have gorgeous, gorgeous spots on them. So mole salamanders are uh, a group of salamanders found in the United States. So we have uh, numerous species. But they're called mole salamanders because they spend most of their time underground um, in old rotten root tunnels and in, in uh, burrows dug by uh, other animals. Um, they emerge, this particular species you're going to see two weeks out of the year. Um, they're above ground because they migrate to their breeding pools, they lay their eggs, and then they move on. Occasionally you might find one after a really heavy rain or when flipping logs, 
in the forest. But typically they're underground after the first, uh, they'll breed anywhere from February to March, depending on the temperatures and the rains. And then they uh, head back on the ground. So these guys eat insects, they eat worms. Um, and it's just, just a pretty sizable, beautiful animal. Those, those yellow enamel dots on their back are just absolutely terrific. And those dots are unique to individuals. So you can identify individual salamanders by their pattern. No two spotted salamanders have the same spots on them. And like me, this is, he's not real comfortable with technology. So that's one of our native salamanders here in Maryland. And this is one of the species that we uh, take groups out to observe in the springtime during our vernal pool hikes. So we have a question. Is it easy to raise frogs from tadpoles? It depends on the tadpole. So um, many classrooms have tadpoles in their rooms. Um, so our, our native species like bullfrogs and wood frogs, um, the tadpoles are vegetarians. So if you have a tank, if you collect some tadpoles from a pond and you want to watch the process at home um, and they're collected from someplace where you're legally allowed to do that, um, it's, it's, it's not difficult. Um, they eat algae, you can give them uh, stuff like boiled lettuce, uh, any, any plants that you find in the pond that they came from, or your typical flaked fish food, the algae-based fish food that you uh, feed fish, um, those tadpoles will feed on. Um, the larvae of salamanders are different. Salamander larvae are predatory, so they eat um, daphnia, um, all the zooplankton that's swimming around in these ponds. As they get larger, they'll eat other tadpoles, they'll eat worms, and then um, um, they morph, morph out and start their life on land. Uh, so that's one of the really amazing things about metamorphosis in frogs is that as a tadpole, they're vegetarian, they're eating plants, and they have a digestive tract designed to break down plant matter. And then as they morph out, not only are they changing from a gilled tadpole to a lunged air-breathing frog, their entire digestive tract has to switch over to being a meat-eating digestive system because frogs and toads eat worms and insects and things like that. Uh, so it's almost a, it's a complete change of the body system. So as common as that idea of a frog for a tadpole is, most people are familiar with it. When you stop to think about it, it's really an amazing, amazing process. It, it's you know it's kind of like you know, us growing up and getting three more stomachs and grazing on grass the rest of our lives. It's, it's, it's an amazing process that goes, um, goes on with these animals. And there's a lot that can go wrong, because uh, again, they're starting their life in water. Um, they breathe through gills, just like a fish does. Um, so any toxin in that water can interrupt that process. And then they're very vulnerable leaving that um, when their entire system changes over, they have to go out onto land. Um, and if um, there's a parking lot where the forest used to be, that's, that's another uh, uh, vulnerable hit to them. So um, we certainly want to protect our amphibian population as much as possible. Um, so we saw a spotted salamander. I rinsed my hands off in my little bin down here. And I'm going to get another example of a um, native U.S. salamander. This is not a one found here in Maryland. We have a relative of it, but these are a little bit bigger and a little bit jumpier. So this is a western tiger salamander. So we have eastern tiger salamanders in Maryland. They're an endangered species, and they're only found in a few counties now. Um, Western tigers, which um, a few years ago became their own species, I mean, uh, uh, they were split out um, from the Easterns on the basis of DNA. Um, and they're really very variable. Some of these guys have yellow stripes. This particular one is kind of green with black um, modeling. If I can get them to turn around, they have the greatest derpy faces ever. Show your derpy face to everybody. There he is. I'm gonna, and I have a towel over the laptop so that 
when that happens, when he jumps on it, he doesn't hit any keys. Oh, there he is. Awesome. So tiger salamanders are mole salamanders as well. They're our largest land-dwelling salamander in the United States. Um, some tiger uh, uh, salamander species can get about 10 or 11 inches long. Um, they eat worms, grubs, beetles, pretty much anything they can get into that uh, mouth of theirs. And they catch their prey with a very short um, uh, projecting tongue. It's not as large as um, some of the frogs can really shoot their tongue out, but they do, they, they'll kind of flip their tongue out to grab their prey, and then they kind of just bash it about until, it's, uh, until the worm is able to be swallowed. Um, but if you look at his body shape, uh, in comparison to that picture that we showed earlier, uh, the larvae have that big tail fin that goes along the back and then down the tail. And of course, as larvae, they have those external gills. He's gonna to try to snap my finger, thinking it's a worm. Um, but they get absorbed. That gill uh, along the back and the tail gets, uh, the fin along the back and tail gets absorbed. And then they take on this more terrestrial shape. I didn't drop him, he's right there. So that's our tiger salamander. And he's, these guys are just really awesome. Um, these are sometimes sold in their larval stage. Um, not so much in our part of the country, but out west and down south, the larvae are sold as fishing bait. And that's a big issue because they get introduced and released into areas where they're not supposed to be. So somebody will buy a bucket of tiger salmon or larvae at a bait shop in Texas. Um, they may go to Arkansas fishing and just dump out whatever larvae they don't use as bait that day. Um, so those animals can then get um, introduced into an area they're not supposed to be. There's a risk of disease getting transferred. So um, again, it's not really an issue in the Northeast, um, but every state has different laws and regulations. So um, the tiger salamander is actually invasive in some states um, where it wasn't normally because of that reason. Um, tiger salamanders also have this unique um, it's not just tiger salamanders, but it, it happens a lot in tigers. Something called neoteny, where if the larvae are in a pond or a lake in an environment that's pretty inhospitable to life on land, they'll actually stay their entire life as larvae, and they will morph out. They, they won't morph out, but they, gain, they have the ability to reproduce in that larval stage. So you have tiger salamanders in cattle tanks, uh, which are big watering troughs in the middle of the desert, um, that spend their whole life in the larval stage with gills in the water. They reproduce in the water. They just never morph out, um, and that's uh, and that just depends on the environment they're in. And in some populations, some years they morph out, some years they don't. Um, so again, it's it's there's a lot of variability and, and quirks with amphibians, and that's that's kind of what's fun about them. Um, Okay, I think we got most of our questions covered so far. So those are some salamanders. And the only frog I have available, I wasn't able to find any toads. It's been kind of cold. They have been out breeding, but um, I do have a frog. Now, we mentioned that worldwide, we have about 7,000 species of frogs. And some are super tiny, like our spring peepers, and some are a little bit bigger. Some are really big. So this is an African bullfrog. Um, and African bullfrogs, as their name implies, are from um, South Africa. And I'm gonna put the towel on the computer again because they have a habit of peeing when they're upset. I, again, I don't want, I get peed on all the time by amphibians, but we don't want the hardware getting peed on. So this African bullfrog is from um, savanna grassland habitats in, in um, South Africa. And He's just mass. He's he just he's like a big softball, or this is pretty much what they do. They sit there and they wait for food to come by. What's unique? Well, they have a lot of unique things about these frogs. One unique feature is they actually have teeth. They have these really sharp, bony projections inside their mouth, and if they latch onto you, which he will, which is why I'm holding him from behind, they will draw blood, and it hurts. Um, they have a very almost razor sharp ridge to their mouth 
And that's because it's just a prey item that they eat, which is literally anything that walks in front of them. Um, they'll attack rodents, they'll attack other frogs, certainly insects. Um, and they also use those teeth, the males, to defend territories. So these frogs spend a lot of time underground in a state called estivation. So when it's really hot and dry, they bury themselves beneath the soil. They form an envelope of skin around them that dries out almost like a parchment uh, consistency. And they just stay cocooned under the earth until the rains come. Because where they're from, they have very hot, dry times and then they have wet times. So when those rains finally come, they dig back out and they have these explosive breeding uh, activity in the temporary ponds. Male African bullfrogs will actually defend their eggs and defend their territories from other males. I know, they're very active today. So they'll, they'll fight to defend their tadpoles and then their eggs um, are, are protected and have to morph out very quickly. So their whole life cycle from egg to small frog that may only be a month or so, depending on how fast those ponds dry up. And he's just one, one awesome animal. That's our African bullfrog. We have the American bullfrog here in the United States. Um, it, it's a different family of frogs, but this, this animal is just pretty impressive. These are actually a very common um, frog sold in pet stores. I'm getting my fingers way too close to his mouth. Um, and reptile expos, you can buy them. They're like the size of a quarter um, when most pet stores sell them. Um, but they eat and they eat and they eat and they get giant. Um, they do make actually really good captives to make good education animals, but they don't require a large cage, kind of a cage with some um, moist soil, uh, a big shallow water dish, because they literally they just kind of bury down until the only thing sticking above the soil is their eyeballs, and they just they wait there for some food to come by. And then when food comes by, they grab it and they shove it in their mouth with their two front legs. And as long as it fits in that wide mouth, they, they swallow it down. And he's got these, if I can get them on camera, he's got these ridiculously short little legs. They're not really designed for long-term jumping contests, so they're not gonna win any frog jumping contests with these, with these stubby little hind legs. Um, they're designed to just kind of walk through their environment, which he's trying to do now. Come here. You can't jump on my lap. So he's our African bullfrog, and we're going to put him back now. Say goodbye. The safest way to hold him is kind of like a cheeseburger, because they, they will bite you. Because usually everything that moves is food. I didn't get the laptop too dirty with him. All right. So we covered our frogs, we covered our salamanders. Um, I'm just going through, does anybody have any questions? Uh, let's see, blah, blah. We can talk um, with our Herp Club at the Natural History Society. We, um, again, we have lots of disciplines of folks that are part of that club. And it's kind of twofold. It's, um, uh, it's, it's a lot of education about how the animals live in the wild. We do field trips to see how they live in the wild. Um, but it's also about promoting responsible ownership. Reptile and amphibians are actually a very popular pet in the United States. They, um, lots of people keep them, and um, there's nothing wrong with that, um, as long as the animals are cared for with their natural history in mind. And that's something that um, has been lost a little bit, and that's one of the main focuses of our herd club, is to connect, especially younger folks that keep reptiles and amphibians as pets, connect them with how these animals live in the wild. Um, because if you know how these animals live in the wild, you're gonna be able to recreate that in captivity and have a healthier, happier animal. Um, and we promote acquiring animals from captive breeding uh, situations uh, so that we're obviously limiting the take of animals from the wild because the wild population really can't support that anymore. Um, what is behind me? Do you have the same pets throughout the year? Uh, that's a great question, David. So um, this is a bank of cages. This is um, my reptile room here. Um, we have uh, uh, quite a few species that we keep and breed um, at my place. Um, so behind me is just a bank of cages with, we got some rat snakes up there in that cage. Um, and then some other, other species. It, it, 
too numerous to mention right now. Um, but yes, uh, I pretty much, as far as what I keep, I keep pretty much keep the same species throughout the year. Um, there's some species I breed. Um, and in my role with the Natural History Society, I do keep uh, certain native amphibians because we do a lot of programs at the building. Uh, we do things like this. So it's just nice to have um, an example of some of the local um, uh, species that people may see. Um, so it's basically like one of, you know, I have the one spotted salamander because um, it's, it's not something that people are going to see any other time of the year unless you're in the woods on a 40 degree February night in the rain. Um, and uh, a lot of folks are familiar with our little redback salamanders, which are really common if you're in the woods flipping logs. Um, but their minds are blown when they see a seven inch long um, black and yellow spotted salamander. Um, so it's, it's um, those animals serve an important role to uh, as stewards for the species in the wild. Knew I had to get that question eventually. What is the difference between a frog and a toad? That's a, that's a classic question and it's a, and it's a very, Good question. So the difference between a frog and a toad. All toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. So toads are a subset of frogs. Um, it's, they're a type of frog. So uh, toads are characterized by their uh, drier, uh, bumpier skin, and they tend to live in more terrestrial habitats, meaning you'll, you'll find a toad hopping around your garden, when, you, when there's no pond anywhere in sight. Um, they're able to live in drier environments. Toads generally only migrate to ponds for breeding. Um, they lay their eggs like most frogs do in the water, and then they disperse into upland habitats. So they'll live in forests, grasslands. The way they protect themselves from drying out, even though they do have that drier skin, it's still a permeable skin they spend a lot of their time underground. So toads will usually stay underground during the day or under leaf cover and then come out at night um, or after a rain and hunt for worms and insects. Um, awesome question and um, glad we addressed that. So do you breed animals for show or do you find them? Uh, um, so the question was, do I breed animals to show or do you find them in the wild and put them back? So. It, in most jurisdictions, and in Maryland included, it is not legal to take an animal from the wild. Um, in most cases, it's not legal to take it from the wild anyway, but to take it from the wild and then release it back into the wild. Um, so any animals that, are, that I personally breed, they tend to be animals that are um, uh, for the pet trade. Um, Animals bred in captivity for re-release in the wild that's generally done under very controlled scientific conditions, uh, kind of like the golden toads in, Co in, in Panama uh, and, and some other species in Costa Rica, um, where you have a critically endangered animal, they take those animals out of the wild to a lab setting, breed them, and then reintroduce those animals um, into the wild. The hellbender is another example. A lot of zoos have recently become successful breeding hellbenders in captivity. So they have very controlled situations where they release those hellbender offspring back into ranges where they used to be. The problem is uh, we can breed a lot of animals in captivity now. Hellbenders and, and uh, a lot of the frogs that are affected by the chytrid fungus that's killing frogs worldwide. But if the habitat isn't there to release the animal back into, if you don't have a healthy habitat to release those animals back into, they're doomed. And that's what they're, they're, they're seeing with um, a lot of the frog species in Central America, where they have literally hundreds that they bred in captivity, but the fungus is still endemic in the habitat, and they know if they put it in that habitat, they're all going to die. So the question becomes, do you just consistent, re consistent re release animals there, in hopes that nature is going to slowly develop a, an immunity to that fungus. Um, th there's no easy answer, but um, the, I personally don't breed any animal that I don't have an outlet for, uh, if that makes sense. Um, because again, we don't want, and it's never ever ever acceptable, as long as we're on the topic of pet reptiles and amphibians, it's never ever acceptable to release captive animals into the wild. Whether they're native to that area or not, um, uh, because once they're in captivity, uh, there's a chance of them picking up pathogens um, that may be 
released into the wild population that wasn't there before. Um, and, and you may be putting an animal that genetics are unique to its little population and you're moving it from one area to another. Um, it's just, it's, it's not a good idea. And that's a lot, and a lot of what, how the chytrid fungus got spread worldwide was because of that, was movement of animals from one location to another. Um, and then it just kind of exploded. Um, um, I told you she has in her yard. Okay, so okay. Uh, what should she do to keep him happy? Uh, could it be the same to you saw a few years ago? About size of the pond. Okay, so um, let's talk about amphibians in our backyard because that's um, that was another talk I was going to be doing um, somewhere else this spring and it didn't happen um, because of this pathogen. So um, we can certainly make we. A lot, a lot of folks kind of feel helpless because we can't do a whole heck of a lot about what coal companies and oil companies do on a global basis. What we can absolutely do is talk to each other about saving the environment and we can take care of our little tiny piece of the environment that we have control of. Um, and if we each control and take care of our little piece of the environment, that, that's going to that's gonna have a, uh, an effect exponentially. So your backyard, you have a toad in your backyard, and that's awesome. That shows that you have food, water, and cover for that animal. So how do you make your yard more toad friendly or more salamander friendly? The first thing you gotta do is not use pesticides and not use herbicides um, because those chemicals, um, well, the chemicals period are gonna eliminate the bugs that your amphibians are gonna eat. So anytime you can have a more natural type of pest control, which encouraging toads and, and salamanders is kind of a natural pest control. Um, you wanna provide cover. Um, don't rake your leaves in the fall. When the leaves fall on the lawn, awesome, leave them there. Um, it's best to, if you gotta pick, if you have to pick up leaves, it's better to do it in the springtime. But the leaves form an insulating blanket and your salamanders, toads and frogs are gonna hibernate under that. It keeps them protected. It also creates a microhabitat. When you're thinking about toads and salamanders, remember, they spend their entire life two to three inches from the ground. It's a totally different world than what we're experiencing up here. Our temperature and humidity is way different than it is two inches from the ground. So if you have a layer of leaves, you're gonna have these little bugs, insects that inhabit that, that are gonna be food for the amphibians, and the amphibians are gonna be protected and a, a, have moist cover to hide in. Um, if you can, put out a water source, a small pond, something like that, uh, for the toads to sit in. They sell these cute little toad houses that are like little flower pots with holes in them. And you can make your own that way. If you have a broken flower pot and you turn it upside down, a little hole, the toad can get in there and hide. But you basically just wanna make a, uh, a happy, uh, hospitable habitat for amphibians uh, around your home. And the, and the key, one of the most important things is to not use um, pesticides because once the insects aren't there then the amphibians have nothing to feed on. So thank you for asking about that. Um, Debbie was I remember buying chameleons at a circus when when we were when I was little. Uh, of course they didn't live long. Was the sale of these banned? It seems to be abusive to me. Okay so yeah so Unfortunately, at some of the fairs that still come through in the summertime, they um, sell or give away prizes, chameleons, which are actually American anole, green anole lizards. They're a native lizard to the south, uh, eastern United States. They change color, so they were kind of termed chameleons. They're not true chameleons, which are an African, um, an old world animal. Um, most places have stopped, but some shops in like Ocean City still sell them. Um, Locally, if you see uh, a fair come through and the, any, they can't use animals as an enticement or a prize. So if it's one of these games of chance and they're giving away little lizards or um, uh, they used to have dyed chicks that they would give away, crazy stuff. That's not legal in, our, in uh, Maryland, um, according to the Department of Agriculture. So that is not legal anymore. And yes, it was a bad idea because obviously anybody winning a reptile or any animal for that matter as a, as a prize have no plans for it, no way to take care of it. 
Uh, any, any, again, responsible pet ownership means um, keeping animals a responsible way, keeping them the best we can, keeping in mind their, their, their needs from the natural habitat. So that means acquiring wherever possible captive bred animals and, and mimicking their natural environment in our homes knowing what you have to feed them. You know, if you, if you can't get um, frozen rabbits regularly, then you probably shouldn't have a pet python because guess what, that's what they eat. Um, if, or a little anole lizard, which can be great pets, but they need a lot of crickets and mealworms. And if you're really freaked out by bugs and, and mealworms, it's probably not gonna be a good pet for you. Um, but luckily there's two, two things we forget in our modern world, books. So if we're going in the field, um, younger folks or even older folks like me, field guides are a terrific resource. There's a field guide for every part of the country where we live. Um, so if you're finding salamanders, frogs in the wild, you need to identify them. Keeping one of these in your, in your backpack when you're out is, is a great way to learn about our native reptiles and amphibians. Along those lines, um, we have the, in Maryland, the um, Atlas, the Maryland Amphibian Reptile Atlas, which the Natural History Society of Maryland was uh, an integral part of putting this book together. Now this is a county by county um, guide for every reptile and amphibian species that's found in Maryland. Um, we had a core of volunteers that uh, did surveys. Um, some ranges of animals were actually expanded as a result. Um, and it was, it, this is the most up-to-date um, survey of the species in our state, as well as uh, their ranges and their natural history. So a great resource. They are available through the Natural History Society of Maryland. We have signed copies available for sale. Um, you can acquire it at MarylandNature.org. Um, books are still a very important part of our learning. Online is terrific, and, and having information at our fingertips is great, um, but there's really no... Uh, substitute for written text and this face-to-face -face exchange of information and that's what our organization is all about that's what the herp club is all about is about um, exchanging the knowledge um, from uh, from person to person and it, it is again it's not top-down knowledge exchange goes always um, there's not a single time I attend an event at um, our building or um, one of our get-togethers where I don't learn something. And that's pretty awesome being, you know, in my 20s, I'm still learning. Um, and if you believe that, I got a bridge to sell you. But um, I, if that's all the questions, I thank you all for, for being here. I really, really hope that we can get together in person really soon, again, in the field, um, taking hikes. Um, last year, we had some wonderful hikes, um, uh, found a lot of species. We get dirty and muddy, the kids especially. Kids have to get dirty, they have to get muddy, they have to be able to you know, safely handle animals um, because otherwise there's just no appreciation for it. Um, that passion starts by getting kids of all ages out in the field and seeing how these animals live and seeing you know, what's around us. Because that's, that's the only way they're gonna want to fight for the environment, that's the only way they're gonna want to vote for people that wanna save the environment. They have to be immersed in it. They have to have firsthand. Um, it has to be more than just a screen. They have to be able to get dirty and touch it. Um, I'm a big, I, I'm an advocate of hands-on when it comes to nature. Um, boardwalk, uh, staying above the environment and not touching anything is fine as an adult. Um, kids have to get immersed in it. Um, that's the only way they learn. Um, and it's something we're all passionate about. So um, if that's all, um, Thank you all again, and I hope we can do this really soon. Uh, if you want to join the Herb Club, please do, because I think next month's meeting is probably going to be a Zoom meeting um, for the Herb Club. And we're, it's a really fun group. And when we're together, we have coffee and donuts. But until then, we'll have to uh, just do this. Thank you, Tom. This has been fabulous. And thank you, everybody else, for, for joining us. We hope that you have learned something and then can share this knowledge with others. Um, and stay tuned. We'll be uh, having some more programs um, as we all navigate this new strange world that, that we are inhabiting. But thank and also, you. If, any, if anybody has questions after the fact, just shoot us, shoot us an email. 
um, T. Scollins at uh, MarylandNature.org or just send them through the Facebook um, mm -hmm. Messenger. Uh, I'm, I'm always available to answer questions via email. Not a problem. Thank you, everybody. Bye now.